Good afternoon and welcome to the Green Mountain Care Board. My name is Kevin Mullen, Chair of the Board, and we're about to call this meeting to order. The first item on the agenda will be the Executive Director's Report. Susan Barrett. Thank you, Chair Mullen. Good afternoon. I have several announcements and scheduling, including scheduling, public comment, and some job openings at the Board. First, I want to start with our upcoming schedule. Next week, we will be hearing from MVP and Blue Cross Blue Shield on their qualified health plan requests. As a reminder, on Monday, July 19th, starting at 8 a.m., we will hear from MVP. And then on Wednesday, July 21st, again, starting at 8 a.m., we will hear from Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont. Um, these, all of these meetings are on Teams. On Thursday, we do have time held if we need additional time for the rate review hearings. That again starts at 8 a.m. as a TBD and a tentative um, rate review hearing. Then on Thursday evening from 4 to 6 p.m., we have the rate review public comment forum. And that is where uh, members of the public can share their comments with the board on the rate requests, again through Teams and again from 4 to 6 p.m. Um, the other announcement is that we did receive the hospital budget submissions. They were due July 1st. Those will be, uh, they are on the website, the narratives, and we'll be continuing, our team will be reviewing those and putting additional information on the hospital budget submissions on our website. We will be opening up uh, an official public comment period at the end of this month. But as many of you know, and as a reminder that we take public comment on any of our work at any time. Um, so those are the scheduling announcements. Shifting to public comment, we have several ongoing public comment periods right now. We have um, until July 22nd at 1159 PM public comment period on the proposed rates from Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont and MVP Healthcare. And then we also have an ongoing public comment period um, that was opened on June 30th and will end on August 10th regarding our data submission rules and data release um, rule. And that information on those rules can be found on our website and a way to provide your public comment. And then last, as I've announced on um, previous meetings, we have an ongoing public comment period on a potential next agreement with CMMI and the all-payer model. Um, that is uh, ongoing, as I said, and any of the public comments that are submitted to us, we share with our partners at AHS and the governor's office as they are leading those negotiations. And then my last announcement is um, regarding some job openings. We have two staff positions available at the board right now. These positions are um, posted on our website. One is a senior health policy analyst and one is a healthcare project director. And then I, I'm also pleased to announce that yesterday the position um, for the uh, vacancy that we'll have uh, in September for a new board member has been posted. The, that hiring and review process uh, takes place through the Green Mountain Care Board Nominating Committee. And uh, we do uh, put that posting on our website and there are, um, there are links to find out more about that posting on our website. So that is all I have to announce, Mr. Chair. I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Susan. The next item on the agenda are the minutes of Wednesday, June 30th. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. It's been moved by Maureen and seconded by Tom to approve the minutes of Wednesday, June 30th without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Let the record show the minutes were approved unanimously. So now the, the focus of today's meeting is to get an update from our data team. And I'm going to turn the meeting over to Jeff Batista and Lindsay Kill. And I'm not sure which one of you will start off, but take it away. And we do see your report.
but we don't hear either one of you. <laughs> Forgive me, Mr. Chair. I'm uh, just figuring out how to present after I share the screen. Uh, <laughs> any hot tips will be welcome. Let's see. Uh, control F5. There you go. Wonderful. So uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jeff Batista, and uh, Lindsay Kill is joining us today. Um, we will be discussing our approach as we enter year two of our hospital report work. Uh, we've done presentations on this in August 2020 and a bit on uh, January 21 as well. Uh, the agenda for today is the hospital report. Uh, the hospital report as a whole complements the GMCB's projects such as sustainability, ATRAP, hospital budgets, and broader regulatory integration. Uh, really, it's just the A team's efforts as we delve into two simultaneous two data sets simultaneously, uh, the claims database, speakers, and the hospital discharge database, VUDs, as well as other data sources to yield richer insights for these processes. Um, so the research questions of this report in general are, where do Vermont residents seek care at hospitals? Uh, where do Vermont hospitals patients come from? A more provider-oriented view. And how do these trends impact residents and providers? Now, when we speak to the impacts, we're not just talking about the cost and utilization, but also as we delve deeper into the data, um, healthcare outcomes, perhaps some gaps in where care may, where uh, providers may need to be placed. Um, all this theoretical work, and it's a work in progress as we move forward with it. Uh, so today's agenda, uh, we're going to walk through the data we have at our disposal. This may be old hat to some of the regulars here at the meetings, but perhaps a refresher for others. Um, how we have used these data to date, uh, how we're improving the data connections, as well as what can we do with the data moving forward. So delving into the first data set, we have VUDS. Uh, this is the Vermont Uniform Hospital Discharge Database. Um, it began in the early 80s, as I understand. We have data going back to 2006, including inpatient and outpatient claim, um, episodes. Um, an episode is essentially everything that happens prior to a discharge at a hospital. Um, the database includes the charge amounts, that's the charge master, not necessarily what's paid by the insurance uh, payer, uh, diagnoses, procedures, um, as well as uh, revenue codes and uh, demographic details for the uh, patients. It includes all payers, not just uh, ones that pay claims. This includes self-pay and free care, though the numbers aren't too big on that um, to show at a public level quite yet. It does exclude Vermont residents at non-Vermont hospitals, actual paid and out-of-pocket amounts for care, patient identifiers, which is pretty typical for a large data set. You don't want um, SSNs and birth dates on that sort of stuff. Uh, but we can point out the uh, race data, gender data to varying degrees of certainty. Um, also, we it excludes clinical data uh, from EMR and clinical notes, as well as all professional uh, payments made for these hospital encounters. I'll pass it on to Lindsay. Thank you, Jeff. Hi, everyone. This is Lindsay Kill. Um, I'm going to talk about the vCures database, and then I'll also talk about um, the comparison between the two, which is really relevant to later slides. So vCures is Vermont's all-payer claims database. Um, what we have in terms of what's included in vCures data for 2007 and on with six months of run out. We have medical claims and retail pharmacy claims as, as well as the insurance payment information for those claims. So what did insurance pay the portion of that? And then also we have what we call the expected member shares. So these are values like the co-insurance, co-pay and deductible. We have insurance eligibility information, and um, we have that information for Vermont Medicaid, Medicare, um, commercial insurances, the QHP and large group, um, but a caveat here, we have um, only about half of the commercial self-funded market is included in VCARES. And then what's excluded from BCure is what doesn't often get talked about. Um, we don't actually have any patient, um, personal health information. So we don't have name, birth date, social security number, um, those individual identifiers. We do not have any clinical data from the EMR or clinical notes. 
we don't have health costs or utilization for uninsured persons. And similarly, we don't have health costs or utilization for that other half of the commercial self-funded market, workman's compensation, TRICARE, um, VA plans, the federal employee plans, self-pay or um, payers who insure less than 200 Vermont residents. The next slide, please. So I'm on slide five of this presentation. Um, here we're looking at uh, a very high level of the summary of differences between these two data sets. Um, and we've broken out um, some of the uh, variables that you would find in one versus the other and the variables you would find in both. So um, I'm just going to go over individually the variables that we have in both. Um, because this directly impacts the research we're going to talk about on future slides. We have in both data sets the DRG, that stands for the Diagnostic Related Grouper, which is something you will find on your inpatient hospitalizations. We have revenue codes in both data sets. We have a, a level of aggregation for inpatient episode in both data sets, um, although it's worth noting that in vCures, we build this from scratch, and in VUDS, it's built, it comes pre-built. Um, we have the hospital charge amount, which, as Jeff pointed out, um, is reflective um, of the like the charge master information and is is not the same as what insurance actually ultimately pays. Um, we have the payer that pays for the episode of care, so your Medicaid or Medicare, so on and so forth. And we have um, dates of service, specifically um, discharge dates. Um, slide six, please. Thank you. So before we move into um, currently what we're working on, we just wanted to give a refresher of some of the similar projects uh, leveraging hospital um, and HSA information um, that we've done to date. And so the project that we presented before was the patient migration project. The objective of this project was to follow residents' movement um, in state between these HSAs and out of state or in other regions, I think specifically we called out the um, Albany medical area uh, region around that hospital and then the, the area around Dartmouth-Hitchcock. Um, important to note that in the patient migration project, we aggregate expenditures as claim payments. Um, the total medical and pharmacy um, payments paid by insurance and we defined a patient in that project as anyone who had medical coverage at any point in the years that are covered in that project, 2014 to 2019. Um, we have a list of the variables that are in that project and um, values. And um, just important to note that with the latest work, which we'll talk about in a future slide, um, some of this project have been expanded on because they are related. And so the advances that we're making to patient migration are the addition of MSDR gene which um, really helps explain a little bit of the like why people travel, so the types of care that they're getting when they travel. Um, we have, as I mentioned, we've added this episode logic, which needed to be built from scratch um, for vCures. So we've added that. And then we are adding care type flags to flag ambulatory care sensitive conditions and tertiary care. And on slide seven is just a screenshot of um, part of the presentation that already exists. If you follow the link that's on slide six, you'll land on the report page for the patient migration report. And you can see and, and play around with all of this. Um, and of course, let us know if you have any questions. Um, Jeff? Thanks, Lindsay. Um, so moving on to the related patient origin report, it's um, one might call it a doppelganger of patient migration except using vCures, so it's very much from the provider perspective. Uh, the objective is to track changes to hospitals' patients and the care they receive. Uh, we define hospitals as all hospitals subject to budget review. Uh, patients are everyone who has received care. 
uh, inpatient care in this case with version two, as it's, uh, we're delving deeper into the data, so we're limiting uh, the scope of what we're working with um, at hospital or its practices. Um, you can note the variables to the right, um, as well as some new variables that advance our understanding of how we're moving through this. This includes MDC, so major diagnostic categories, the uh, MSDRG is that Lindsay has explained, DRG weights, which indicate roughly the severity of a, a given DRG and the length of stay. Moving on to um, a visual of where we're going with this. Um, so here I've broken down the inpatient episodes uh, present in VUDS uh, 2014 to 2019. Um, when we add the musculoskeletal paid by Medicare, so payer and major di diagnostic category, we see the charges in the episodes change and the relationship among the hospitals change. Um, and then filtering that down further to the type of hospital, you can see sort of, it's like a map of the, of the solar system. You have a bunch of small planets and some large ones. Delve into those small planets, get a higher resolution view of uh, how people are performing at the uh, musculoskeletal by, paid by Medicare among small hospitals. So you get deeper and deeper detail as you move forward. Um, and we're visualizing in different ways. The past presentations have shown maps. There are, of course, tables and files that go along with it. And as we uh, think about the final published product for this version two of patient origin, um, we can factor in opinions on that moving forward. So moving on to the other sorts of data at our disposal. So we take a broad view of what's available to us here at the GMCB analytics team. Uh, there is, of course, firm data available uh, that's come up quite a bit in the um, hospital budget process. It's in our adaptive uh, used by the finance team uh, and the sustainability work as well. Um, service lines, quality, um, other things specifically re related to the hospitals as firms and their context. Um, also, we have community data. This includes the U.S. Census data. 2020 is coming out in a more and more detail every week, so waiting on that. Um, but before that, we have the American Community Survey, which estimates census information in uh, years where they don't conduct the census. We also have other federal and state resources, um, whether that's uh, CDC's SVI, uh, Social Vulnerability Index, um, other metrics that you can uh, define census tracts or patients. Uh, we turn to every source we can and figure out what's best for the question at hand. Uh, we also have spatial data. That's something we've brought up over the past year, including where people live at different levels, whether it's a uh, zip code, HSA, tract, really depending on how we want to link that for any given study, and uh, how people access care. Uh, we can uh, model drive times to primary care, for example. We have uh, shape files representing the transportation system of Vermont at different levels, and uh, we can factor that all in as well. Uh, there is also human services data. Right now, this mostly takes uh, the form of reports we read on, say, the efficacy of SASH or Blueprint for Health, um, really existing resources we can use to figure out coefficients if we're running something down the line, um, as well as uh, public insights not just other studies in the realm of work that we do, but the frame that they're portrayed so we can really uh, deliver results um, that suit uh, the public's needs. This is just a brief run through of the sorts of data we have on hand. Um, so you'll note uh, the distribution of uh, people with health insurance. This is from one of our visuals on the data visual uh, page on the GMCP website. Uh, here's some of the drive time modeling and here we see some of the demographics uh, taken from the social vulnerability index from the census, um, or rather the ACS, uh, breaking down data both by tract and um, uh, by HSA, which requires a crosswalk to calculate that, um, that we had to design ourselves. So we've thrown a lot of data at you, um, and it's great to razzle-dazzle people, but how does it all come together? And by bringing in not just the claims and the discharges, we can make a, and bring in other sorts of data. We can create a whole that's greater than the sum of all these parts. Um, now, these are a bit messy sketches here. I don't have uh, an overhead in front of me. Um, but I want to imagine this as if, say, you're Coco Chanel, and you want to make a haute, you're, you're working in haute couture, and you want to sketch a dress. 
And it's really the first stage of where you're going with making the dress. You have to consider uh, the types of fabric you have. You have to consider the sizes, the cost, really what the market wants, and perhaps what your predecessors have done and how your dress or fashion advances beyond uh, what's already out there. So when we're looking at how to analyze all these data together, we want to get somewhere where we can isolate different factors of whether it's the community or the patient, uh, sort of statistically separate those or control for them, and then find out how, say, the regulatory processes shape the, the relationship between charges and prices, or how um, hospital service lines are changing, or how that associates with demographic changes on the ground, payer changes, stuff like that, uh, parsing together this $6.5 billion healthcare industry we have uh, with as much precision as we can muster. Um, now, breaking that down into the particular databases we've started with, VUDs and VCures, uh, I want to focus on this impacts um, arrow between charges and pay boxes in the book, the two, uh, the two visuals. Um, it's quite it's a, it's a good place to uh, bring in the next study. Um, so bring, how might these databases complement each other to bring us a greater whole? Um, here we have the study, uh, the effect of safety net closures and conversion on patient travel distances to hospital services from health services research by Batsoli et al. Um, and the main question of that study is, how does physical access, they me use it measuring drive time, um, how do, does the closure of safety net hospitals impact physical access and the behavior of people getting to care among different parts of society? Um, pardon, there are some school kids outside walking by. Um, so the data consists of several states discharged data in the 90s and 2000s. Um, so I wouldn't generalize this stuff to Vermont necessarily, but the states are California, Arizona, Florida, and um, Wisconsin. Uh, U.S. Census data from the same periods at which uh, the, the discharge data was taken from, as well as some AHA annual survey data on hospital characteristics. And with this, they they made uh, drive time a, a in the Y of the equation for healthcare access, and they treated it as a function of patient, hospital, community, so the census tract level stuff, and healthcare system characteristics. And they ran this model for five separate diagnostic categories, including births, um, substance use disorder, and behavioral health, and uh, three others. And what they generally find is that the uninsured and Medicaid patients experience greater disruptions to care when the safety net hospitals nearby closed. Um, these, group, and this, these groups had worse access, particularly for behavioral health and substance use disorder and uh, birthing centers after, after the hospital closures than their commercially insured counterparts. Um, so we're seeing some socio-demographic inequalities here. Um, and it was done with discharge data, but if we add claims, we can add some value there. Uh, for example, claims data have actual paid amounts, uh, which could factor into uh, either the dependent or independent variable as a function of access. Um, this also includes the expected member share, including the out-of-pocket, co-pays, co-deductibles um, that shape affordability. Uh, the claims data also include nearby non-hospital services. For I mean, the hospital database will not include your ambulatory care centers if they're not affiliated with a hospital. Um, so you have your non-hospital services as long as they're registered by claims. Uh, and we can measure how the broader healthcare system sort of interacts with these processes. Um, in our context, uh, isolating these effects in greater detail, we can answer some questions like, how do changes in physical access to a type of care impact, utilization, actual spending, and healthcare outcomes? Um, and we can draw that outcome stuff either from 30-day readmissions in VUDs or uh, some sort of VCURES version. And related, how do these charges in physical access to care impact competition on charges, price, and charge-to-price differences? Um, if you take away one hospital that shapes the ecosystem around it, uh, perhaps we can identify effects there for um, certain line items. Um, example two, uh, you have measuring telemedicine impacts with claims. And the question here, it's from someone's uh, dissertation at the University of Minnesota. Uh, I believe she teaches at Cornell now. Um, uh, her surname is Yu. And the question she asks is, 
Throughout her entire thesis is how do telemedicine visits associate with healthcare utilization, quality, and spending relative to in-person visits? So it's more recent data. It's from an APCD. Um, not quite ready to generalize it to Vermont, but it's a source of uh, methodological inspiration here. Um, so what she did was take commercially insured women under 65 in the claims database with a certain healthcare issue, um, and she measured the difference in their uh, their spending and uh, consumption habits. Um, splitting into two groups, those who had commercial insurance that began to allow direct-to-consumer telemedicine and those that uh, did not cover it. And this difference in difference approach allows you to see the change in effects uh, due to uh, the change in what insurance will pay for subject to all the other things in the model. The results, um, fewer services used, fewer antibiotic prescriptions and lower prescriptions in total and lower total spending during the 30K, their 30 day episode of care. Um, she concludes that direct to, te direct to consumer telemedicine could reduce utilization and spending while maintaining a comparable quality of care to in-person services. Um, again, not generalizable to Vermont uh, uh, as far as I see it. Uh, adding value with discharges. Now, the discharge records, they include non-claim patients, such as free care, uh, workers' comp, um, and self care uh, but exclude telemedicine if it's not from a Vermont hospital. So there's a limitation and a benefit there. Um, discharge records also break down outpatient episodes much more cleanly than a claims data database and uh, uh, by, by a measurable magnitude. It, claims databases are quite complicated, especially isolating outpatient claims or outpatient episodes. Um, so that is an advantage bringing in the discharge database directly from the hospital there. Uh, what would bringing in discharges to this study yield in isolating the effects in greater detail? Uh, some questions that we could answer with it could include, does telemedicine spur price competition for on-site substitutes, um, on-site as in the same care, but not by telemedicine? Uh, does telemedicine adoption associate with change in charges for hospital services? What about changes in price or changes in price to charge ratio? And uh, do these patterns vary based on broadband access or socioeconomic factors, that equity component, um, which can measure at the patient uh, claim or uh, tract level, ideally tract because that's more generalizable um, for this sort of analysis. And what might these patterns mean for health equity in some sort of normative way? I'm going to pass it off to Lindsay. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I'm on slide 19 now. And what I'm going to switch to talking about um, after we've gone through patient migration and patient origin, two previous um, and ongoing projects, and um, some other data sources we have, and then those two papers that Jeff just reviewed for methodological inspiration, we're going to focus now on what are we currently working on and where are we with that project. Um, so. This project, we call it generally hospital markets, but it's really in two pieces. We are trying to work on database alignment, um, which we had a meeting the other day and someone quoted and said it was a very noble goal. <laughs> and we're also working on migration analyses to talk um, more accurately about patient in out migration. So in general, um, we're trying to create these two summary data sets, one from vCures, the claims data, and the other from BUDS, the discharge data. And we're trying to get them both on um, a level of where those variables are really equivalent and meaningful to talk to each other, and then combine the two and eventually use this new combined data set to do a, a more in-depth analysis of patient in and out migration. So this combination of patient migration and patient origin. And we would summarize those by types of care, the payer, and of course, other uh, patient demographics. 
we think that if we could be successful with this project, that it would be potentially applicable to hospital budget review, to CON, and um, you know who knows, maybe other areas um, of uh, our, our regulatory duties here at the GMCB. Um, there are a lot of directions we could take this project in. I'm just uh, mentioning two here. Uh, one would be flagging and analyzing expensive or complex types of care that Vermonters are traveling for. Um, and that could be in within the state or Vermonters to traveling out of state. Um, and then flagging care that Vermont offers for those coming in state to try to understand why do people come and use our hospitals. So uh, just a quick uh, high level overview of the methodology that we are using to try to combine these two data sets. Um, the first thing that we want to note is that uh, for this initial phase, at least, we, we are focusing on inpatient episodes. We would eventually like to add outpatient episodes, but as Jeff already highlighted, um, they're quite complicated on the claim side. And so we thought that um, starting with the inpatient episode, which is a little bit more clean between the admission and the discharge, was a good place to start. We are using the hospital where the care takes place. We are using the MSDRG, which is grouped by the MDC um, codes, the type of care, the weight. Uh, Jeff mentioned DRG weight, which is um, uh, an indicator of severity of sorts and length of stay. Um, we are also using the insurance provider. So is it commercial? Is it Medicare? Is it Medicaid? Um, we are using the patient origin. Where did that person come from? We do have it down to zip code, um, but at this point we are aggregating to the um, um, VDH version four hospital service area. We have charge amounts um, that is available in both data sets. Um, rem recall that VUDS does not have the actual insurance paid amounts. So although charge amounts themselves are not indicative of, ex of real expenditures, um, it is one area we can start to try to find alignment. Uh, we also are counting episodes as uh, an indicator of volume. And of course, other patient demographics, all as inputs to this analysis. And what we're doing is we're trying to aggregate to relevant levels of detail to display the important and significant changes over time. And um, over time for us in this project specifically is 2014 to 2019. Um, next slide, please, Jeff. Thank you. So now I'm on slide 20. Um, what we have completed to date is that we've identified our ambulatory care sensitive conditions. These are conditions of interest to us. And we've flagged our tertiary care episodes. We have a chosen methodology for aggregating both data sets for comparison. And we've created those summary files from both data sets, from BUDS and from VHEARS. Um, next steps, some of which are already currently in progress. Um, we have a methodology review with VAS NSO for the VUD side. Um, VAS NSO pr provides us with VUD, so that's why we're consulting with them. And then On Point is um, the organization that provides us with VCURES. Um, so we're going to talk with them as well about uh, making sure that we've extracted these data correctly and that we're leveraging the correct variables. We would like to continue to test data comparisons on smaller and smaller scales to assess where there may be differences. So for example, looking at how do episodes and charge amounts differ 
between VUDs in 2014 at UVMMC and V Cures in 2014 at UVMMC, and then breaking that down smaller and smaller. Is there more difference depending on payer? Is there more difference across DRGs? Um, and looking at it through that lens. And then, of course, applying this comparison to other analyses, such as the uh, patient in and out migration and potentially even price variation. Um, if we could eventually get these two data sources to a level of agreement to quantify the difference um, with some certainty, then we could really talk about um, the differences that we're seeing in utilization from the provider lens, that's the VUDS data, and financial um, compensation from the payers, which is through VCURES. All right, on to you, Jeff. Awesome. So um, uh, keeping this going with our progress, I'd like to speak to our data linkages and how we're advancing uh, both the level of detail and the efficiency of it. Um, so one major facet of it is that we're using we're using census tracts more often as a standard level level of uh, community measurement. Um, HSAs are a bit uh, old school; they were made in 2006. The patterns that they represent generally hold true, but if we bring in census tracts, we could really uh, uh, bring things to a community based level. Look at those effects much more robustly, and uh, there is a lot more data available at the track level than the HSA level. Um, straight out of the box. Uh, so this includes demographics, the boundaries, and even population centroids, which means you could calculate weighted access um, at a pretty good level at the, at the state level. Um, also, we are able to convert VUDs and VCURE zip codes to tracks now. It's just standard practice, and we can throw it in and line that up with um, columns from the census uh, at any time or other data at the census track level. Um, in addition, we're streamlining our data collection and analysis. This includes dropping, um, not going into computer programs and clicking stuff a lot, but starting to write code that could just be replicated and easily uh, rolled out into other procedures or diagnoses. Um, What's I think a GUI, all, Jeff? A GUI, it's a graphical user interface. Okay. So your old school like Word, uh, rather than a black box where you're uh, typing in a courier new font, uh, yeah, so I didn't want to get lost again. You lost me at Haute Couture. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I've got to speak to a large audience here, Kevin. Um, so <laughs> harnessing existing code, um, we're, we're certainly harnessing existing code. It's like Lego blocks. You build a Lego block, you could add another Lego block that you just built, and soon you have a big structure. Um, and this includes the Tableau workbooks as well, where data can be swapped in and out as it comes in. Um, and we, can, we are starting to disaggregate trends by service line and other dimensions um, to greater detail, which you'll see in future products. Um, in addition, we're exploring the use of APIs, um, application, I don't recall the acronym. It's essentially a way to grab data directly from a database online and um, spin it out uh, without having to download the entire table and load it up and all that. It's very efficient, especially when it comes to uploading things at a regular basis. We could just uh, ping the census and the, the new data will come in and populate the data set that we're working with. Um, and on the horizon, these are sort of stretch goals or medium term goals, I guess you can call them. Um, integrate clinical data with VCURES. Uh, we're not too involved with that um, at the moment, but it's something on our mind, or at least me and Lindsay. Uh, getting more people involved, that includes democratizing the use of public use files, breaking more of those out for other groups. Uh, whether you're at a college or you're an advocate or whatever, uh, to do some analyses by themselves and share that into the broader public sphere of what healthcare is. And connecting this effort with effort with other ongoing data quality work, uh, particularly the broad data validation project, which is going on in different dimensions at this time. So I'll pass it on to Lindsay for uh, limitations. There, yeah, sorry, I got booted off at uh, the wrong time. So I'm here now. <laughs> um, so on slide 22 to talk about limitations. Um, so as we mentioned before, with um, these two main data sources, BUDS and VCURES, 
Um, one limitation is identifying a source of truth. There is value in both hospital discharge data and financial data from claims. We know that there have been efforts and we've been part of efforts um, on the claim side to reconcile claims um, and some of our reports from claims like total cost of care with what the payers have. And that's always looked good. And we also know that on the VUD side of things, um, they have, VAS NSO has done work to reconcile what they're receiving um, from the hospitals with the hospital's records. And that's always looked good. So which one is right when we go to quantify this difference? Um, so that's something that we think about a lot. And also finding agreement across these two different data sets that are already cleaned and curated. Um, we mentioned that VAS NSO provides us with VUDs and they have their own um, aggregating and cleaning steps that they do. And then OnPoint provides us with VCures. They have their own cleaning and curating steps that they do. And so um, understanding the love, the correct levels of detail that we need to find agreement between these two data sets has been um, something that we've worked through iteratively, um, but was worth mentioning. And um, of course, weighing the ethics of connecting all of these data sources, not just speakers and VUDs, but um, bringing in census tract information and adding any clinical indicators we can. And uh, all of this kind of combines to make um, a great picture at the population level, but we just need to remember that it's important as stewards of the data to um, keep it at the population level and um, leverage it in a responsible way. Um, and then lastly, um, uh, COVID effects. So um, right now our data comparison is 2014 to 2019. Obviously the next year to add on there is 2020 and um, we are expecting some um, very uh, big <laughs> changes in the, the trends um, in 2020. And so um, it will complicate our comparisons uh, if and when we add on that year. But um, both Jeff and I are hoping that it's um, an opportunity to, um, you know, measure the same uh, event in the two the in the two different databases the impact of the same event, and so potentially it could be an opportunity to align the data in that way. So, um, yeah, that's all I have on patients. Thanks, Lindsay. So um, I'm just going to wrap up with this slide here. Um, to summarize, uh, we continue to advance our analytic work. Uh, we're leveraging multiple data sources to tease out all these trends across space and society, uh, fully acknowledging all the limitations involved uh, for every particular way we look at a problem, um, just so we can give an honest and transparent and replicable view of what's going on. Um, and also, we want to generate products with increasing efficiency uh, through the use of coding APIs and um, understanding the connection between VCURS and VUDs uh, ever more quickly so that we can begin doing stuff with uh, greater depth. Uh, this is not a simple project, but it's an ongoing what is and how can we know. Um, the ontology and the epistemology of hospital um, activity and how it relates to the healthcare system. And it will shape how multiple projects uh, down the line uh, move forward. So I will wrap up with that and uh, pass it on. Jeff, do you have an estimated timeline for your deliverables? Um, if we're talking Tableau visuals or um, particular data sets? Uh, the completion of the different pieces of these work, do you have a, any type of timeline when, when this will be done, when that will be done, that type of thing? Yeah. Um, Breaking it down, uh, uh, Lindsay may have her own perspectives. Um, the alignment will continue. I think you're going to see certain diagnostic categories, certain types of care, be, certain payers being figured out more quick, quickly than others. Um, so it's really an iterative process there, uh, at least in the short term. In terms of the census data and spatial data, a lot of that's already available. Uh, perhaps some of the code needs to be written uh, to draw that more automatically or at a regular interval, but um, it, it's relatively, uh, it's not too difficult to do. Um, what 
may be a bit more open-ended is some of these more specific analyses in looking at, so we have all this, how can we discern X effect from Y? Uh, that involves some special project chatting and uh, figuring out the scale and scope of the project moving forward. Thanks, okay, questions from the board? I see blue around Robin. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jeff and Lindsay, for the update. It's good to to understand where you are and um, how things are going. I um, It seems like there's a, a lot of promise, I think, for how this will fit in with HRAP, um, in Health Resource Allocation Plan in particular, because I love that you're thinking about the the automatic, like how to make it more automatic and less staff intensive, because that is something as we've been working on HRAP, but, you know, uh, we have minimal staff able to focus on that. And so that kind of flows at the available time that people have. So that will be a great thing. Um, for the hospital market stuff, I think sooner than later, uh, my suggestion would be to really sit down with the hospital budget team and talk now about how that gets integrated into the regulatory process. Um, because for us, having the information and understanding the trends as background is helpful, but it's infinitely more helpful if it's integrated into the regulatory process so that we can actually use it in our decision making. So that would be my suggestion is that there may be things that would be um, higher priority when thought about from a regulatory perspective than from um, you know simply the data perspective. So uh, that would be my thought. Thank you though. it's it's great to see how the progress is going. Thank you. Thanks okay, maybe can I can jump on that. Is that all right? Go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, so thank you, Lindsay and Jeff. That's really helpful. Lots of possible projects, I think, emanating from your work. And I just wanted to build on what Robin was saying. Um, I think it's really important for us to think about how we use this data um, to improve our decision making. And so if you're prioritizing, I would say uh, certainly in the hospital, you know, I see three areas where this, this particular analysis could be useful. One is hospital budget process. Two is HRAP. Uh, both that Robin mentioned, and third is in our rural hospital sustainability work that we're doing with the report due to the legislature in the fall. So prioritizing, uh, I'm not sure you're, you know, I think Kevin's question around your timeline was really helpful if, if it could be kind of more concrete than that. Um, the hospital budget process, this is really, you know, the patient inflows and outflows within a hospital service area or a census tract would be really helpful in, in um, guiding some of the board's decision making around reasonable NPR growth rates. For example, if there's a lot of inflow of patients into a hospital, for example, NPR growth might be higher than expected. Um, but if there's outflows and those trends are downward, then NPR growth would be expected to be slower. And that would be really helpful to us as we're making hospital budget decisions. So I agree completely with Robin. If there's a way to integrate this more quickly, even you know in the next I don't know few weeks, but I'm not sure. Um, so that the hospital, you know, working side by side with the hospital budget team, so that the hospital budget team can have this data as part of their analysis on the requests made by the hospitals around NPR growth would be really helpful. Um, with respect to the rural sustainability report that we have upcoming this fall, uh, we know that patient bypass is uh, a driver of financial vulnerability of rural hospitals. This is where patients living in an HSA bypass their local hospital and, and go to a different hospital. We know it varies by payer type. Um, and so to the degree that there's a way to take this analysis and quantify the amount of patient bypass that's happening within each hospital service area or census track, if that's the, um, you know, the geographic track you're going to use will be really helpful for that report. So really coming up with a way to quantify, is there patient bypass happening here? And, and what's the degree of it? What's the intensity of it? And is it, you know, how do we break it down by payer or by service type? I think would be super helpful. And the HRAP, um, as Robin mentioned, perhaps maybe that's less of a priority, just given the timeline on that, but still a priority in helping us. And I would love to hear how you think that we can use this kind of analysis and the merging of these data sets or, or the alignment of these data sets to think about 
um, improving our understanding of unmet need in hospital service areas um, by you know, merging in data, census tract data, and really thinking about how do we measure unmet need using you know, uh, patient inflows, patient outflows, kind of utilization, and basic demographic characteristics of the community. So I guess the last one is a question. Um, and the other two are maybe asking you to think about how we might achieve some of those goals in our regulatory process, hospital budgets, and, um, and the sustainability report in the timeline that we have upcoming. Long questions. And insightful ones. Um, I'll answer the question of the questions. Um, so measuring the um, a good approach to measure gaps, and it's something I saw in the literature reviewing which studies to put in this presentation, uh, would be measuring the frequency of uh, ambulatory care sensitive conditions that uh, occur in hospital, because if it occurs in a hospital, it's sort of an indication they can't access primary care. Um, that's one example. Uh, I'm sure we can spin out, spin out um, uh, or look at the literature to see what other uh, health outcomes might associate with health care gaps and whether those healthcare gaps are due to uh, perhaps uh, demographic concerns, uh, physical access concerns, or uh, hospital and healthcare uh, market concerns, among other things. Um, and I'll just add to that answer, Jeff, um, specifically for the question um, or request for data around the patient bypass problem. Um, we do have that data available, and so we can, um, on that shorter timeline, work on packaging that for you all. Um, it would be by HSA and uh, uh, whether or not, it, over time, people are seeking care within that HSA or they're going to another HSA and which one they're going to. We have it by expenditures and we have it by claims volume. Great. And is that something that you're working with the hospital budget team now for them to be able to incorporate that in their analysis of the hospital budget submissions? Um, we can. We, we will work with them. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you all. As a follow up on that question, Lindsay, what's the time lag? So, for example, we already um, have seen one hospital um, talk about the fact that they're seeing significant in migration. Mm -hmm. Would we be able to see recent in migration or are we still talking a two year lag? Um, so I may be wrong about this, but your hospital budget review is for 2022. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. So the, the most recent data that we have, unfortunately, is 2020. Um, so and, and we all know that that looks really different. So unfortunately, yeah, it is. There is a little bit of a lag there, which I think is part of the rub with using some of this data um, for the, the uh, imminently, but you know, it can certainly help. Um, and to see the trends over time, I think can be really powerful. So um, you know, if you like it, we can definitely provide the data through 2020. Thank you. Yeah. Other members of the board, Maureen? Um, yeah, just adding on to the, I mean, I think the, the patient migration piece and being able to Track that is is huge, and I, I would add to what um, the areas just said, and also say the um, ACL because we know you know risk and everything was being associated with um, with HCAs and and where people moved to in and out of you know certainly impacts um, the payments received. Um, another thing I think will be interesting to look at um, in light of COVID is were there was there more or less Vermonters getting care outside of the state. You know, did people stay here or did they go back to Florida? You know, what happened there, and you know, and how is that comparing returning as well? Because um, I think that's one of the pieces we're always missing is all of the care that Vermonters get outside the state, um, and then should they return to the state or should that change? You know, that obviously impacts the hospitals and and could create increases at hospitals or vice versa, you know, if more people are moving out. So um, especially with uh, a lot more people that came in um, and stayed in Vermont uh, during COVID, it would be interesting to see, you know, also, I guess we're not sure if you, you don't really track the out-of-state piece in that, but 
Um, I think the migration um, is going to be really important, though, in, in a lot of the work we do. So I just wanted to add the ACL piece, too. But thank you. Very interesting. OK, other members of the board? So I can't, I can't. I have one, one quick question and then just a, a couple observations. Um, one is, I think a while back, within the last year or so, we made an effort to get the um, more of the self-insured uh, commercial uh, into our system. And uh, I remember reading some letters that were sent out to some, some of these folks. Um, did, did that yield any result? Did, did, did we grow our, our self-funded commercial uh, participants uh, by any significant uh, measure? Um, Tom, that effort was picking up right before the pandemic hit. And so I think priorities shifted during the pandemic. But um, um, I know that it's something that we're still working on. Well, that's definitely a fair observation. And otherwise, I, I, I can only echo, you know, Jess and Maureen and Robin uh, on this. I, I think, you know, I'm, I'm struggling as I listen to, to say what's kind of interesting from a hypothetical point of view and, and what can be used here in terms of boots on the ground, in terms of our hospital budget process and our rate review process. Um, and it just seems there's a lot of opportunity there. And, and I think, um, not only talking to um, our rate review team and hospital budget team, but, you know, if you folks could be talking to us about how to ask the right questions, because it's a very, you know, a usually complex set of data that you have. There's a lot of variations that could be scrubbed. And, um, you know, I mean, do we ask a question that is as simplest, simplistic as, you know, we have this uh, rate review filing from XYZ a commercial payer, uh, go find us $3 million of savings um, um, in, in their proposal. So, I mean, that's kind of a, you know, a simple but hardball kind of question, but um, I think it's, it's, it reflects the kind of practicality that would be helpful in terms of um, um, uh, enhancing affordability and, and, and being in a data-based uh, uh, environment kind of going after savings rather than just, you know, um, throwing a dart, uh, you know, a dart at the wall and hope, hope, hoping that it will yield a result. Um, so um, congratulations on this. It, it sounds like a, um, and is a, a, a kind of a, a wonderful uh, integration of a lot of, of a lot of information out there that, that uh, I think can serve Vermonters well. Okay, any, anything else from the board? So hearing none, I'm gonna open it up for public comment. Does any member of the public wish to offer comment? And I'm going to recognize Mort Wasserman first. Mort, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, I echo every all the board members' uh, respect and admiration for the work that you two have done here already. It's quite a daunting task. and. It's amazing what you've accomplished so far. I did seem to hear in passing that you hadn't yet had a chance to focus on primary care. And uh, given that hospital visits and admissions are often uh, a reflection of a failure of primary care, I was wondering how the work was uh, going to be done on primary care and the changes that are happening in primary care, which uh, are certainly affected by the same geographic, uh, demographic uh, factors that are affecting hospital use. Yeah, I'd be happy to jump in. Uh, Lindsay could uh, pop in later if she'd like. Um, so the primary care, um, HRAP has covered quite a bit of that, or it gave us quite a good sense of primary care outside the hospitals themselves. Uh, we're advancing from those uh, insights to, uh, I mean, the hospital database, uh, the, the products can be discerned into, by DRG way, into primary care versus tertiary care at a very basic level or, you know, high level care, low level care. Um, we can also break down specific MSDRGs. And uh, it, it's really just a matter of taking the variables and deciding how we define primary care and then 
uh, popping it out there. Um, in terms of the specific deliverables, we could have, say, a worksheet in the next Tableau visual um, that shows primary care at the hospital level or at the claim level. Um, uh, but it's a, it's an open book. We can go in many different directions, especially after talking with the board and any other stakeholders. Great, thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Mort. Next, I'm gonna call on Eric Schulteis. Eric? Hi. Um, so, you know, obviously Jeff and Lindsay, a uh, wonderful job. It's great to hear about your move towards scripting and coding in terms of access and also replicability and also perhaps looking to update information in a slightly more timely fashion using application programming interfaces. I think um, looking at VODs um, and vCures, I mean, I think it's important to remember that the, the consumer experience or the lived experience is missing from these data sets. And I think, you know, we have to be careful. I'm going to speak from my own background, but I think, you know, if you look at urban planning, in the say 1950s in this kind of technocratic brain, I mean, maybe perhaps best thought out by Bob Moses. Um, and then you look at someone like Jane Jacobs that's really focused on the lived experience, that that's an element that's missing from these data sources. And it's important to acknowledge that behind these numbers, there are actual people and also that there are phenomena of why these people behave in certain ways that aren't captured. So for instance, going back to um, board member Holmes's question about, you know, how do we measure potential access service gaps, right? So yes, you can kind of roughly estimate that population, you know, if they're going to the hospital, right? But that's always gonna lag a bit. It's also gonna leave out the people who are sick but couldn't get to the hospital or were sick and were afraid to go to the hospital because of a bill. So I just, you know, I think as you're moving forward and the data team has always been outstanding in my opinion in this before is to try to frame what the data can and can't tell you and where potential future expansions could go. Because I think, you know, there's the issue of the connecting this to actual regulatory processes, but there's also, as we implement regulatory processes, we want to have them be responsive to the actual experience of Vermonters and not just what we're measuring in these two databases. Thanks. Thank you, Eric. Other members of the public? Other members of the public. Hearing none, I want to thank uh, Lindsay and Jeff uh, for an excellent presentation. Jeff, I'll do a little studying and figure out what Haute Couture is and uh, get back to you on that. And uh, with that, we'll, we'll move on. Thank you so much. Um, next item on the agenda is old business. Is there any old business to come before the board? Seeing none, is there any new business to come before the board? Seeing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. It's been moved by Robin and seconded by Maureen to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Thank you, everyone.